So this um, this talk is um, part two of uh, a, a talk I began last week, where I was talking about the Laodicean church. You should have some notes. I hope I printed enough. If you haven't got some, you want to put your hands up because there's a few spare here on the on the front row that maybe people could uh, come and take if if not. Um, <clears throat> When it comes to <coughs> this um, this message from the to the Church of Laodicea, I honestly thought I'd get it in one go, but uh, there was so much that I wanted to say last week that it's expanded, and I started praying this week, and I just thought the Lord give me just one phrase. So I'm actually just going to take one phrase, and then we'll go on next week as well. Uh, do you know, as you dig deeper into God's word, there's more and more that you can discover. And I think we'll never get to the bottom of what God wants to say to us through his truth. There's so many layers of meaning. So before we start, I'm going to um, just read the passage. And if you enjoy it today and you want to go deeper, you all can look on the King's Church Beverly YouTube channel. You can see the one from last week where I talked about the background so the geography with the hot springs that were just outside uh, Laodicea and things like that, and about lukewarm last week. So here we are. So the angel of the church in Laodicea writes, These are the words of the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the ruler of God's creation. I know your deeds, that you are neither cold nor hot. I wish you were either one or the other. So, because you are lukewarm, neither hot nor cold, I am about to spit you out of my mouth. You say, I am rich, I have acquired wealth and do not need a thing. But you do not realize that you are wretched, pitiful, poor, blind, and naked. I counsel you to buy from me gold refined in the fire, so you can become rich and white clothes to wear so you can cover your shameful nakedness and salve to put on your eyes so you can see. Those whom I love I rebuke and discipline so be earnest and repent. Here I am, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door I will come in and eat with that person and they with me. To the one who is victorious I will give the right to sit with me on my throne just as I was victorious and sat down with my father on his throne. Whoever has ears, let them hear what the Spirit says to the churches. So I began last week by explaining that this series of which Revelation chapter 3 is just a part, and then it will flow on into the Last Supper discourse, John 14, 15, 16 and 17. The, the, the focus or the point of this series is to help us live the Jesus life. And when we compare our life to Jesus, it's a little bit different, isn't it? And it's different not just in morals. You know, Jesus didn't lie, he didn't cheat, he lived a good life. But that's not the only difference. Jesus had power. Jesus had connection. There were so many other things. There was a supernatural dimension with Jesus. Jesus was basically a, a portal between God and earth and the life and the power, the wisdom, the knowledge of God flowed out through Jesus onto the earth and before Jesus was taken away from his disciples physically he gave this great teaching in John 14 to 17 that is different from any other teaching he gave in his, his earthly life which was basically telling them how they could change from being disciples who walked with Jesus to being Christians who had Jesus inside them and how they could live the, the Jesus life filled with the, the Spirit of God. So that's what this series is about and it'll roll on for quite a long time. And so we started by saying uh, if we want the cure we need to know what the problem is and we were looking at being lukewarm last week what that means and how Jesus is knocking on the outside of the church on the outside of our life as Christians 
I'm not going to recap because I've got enough to say from this week um, anyway. But today we're just going to look at this one phrase where Jesus looked at the church and he said, you are blind. I counsel you to buy from me I salve so that you can see. There's so much in this and I've not really been able to write down and finish all the things, the different ideas that came to me. But just um, <clears throat> to start by saying that your perception, how you look at the world, determines how you live in the world. Your eyes, your spiritual eyes, how you look at people, how you look at circumstances, how you look at the world, that determines whether you have joy or sadness, peace or anxiety, victory or defeat. It says in the King James Version in the book of Proverbs, chapter 23, uh, as a man thinketh in his heart, so he is. Henry Ford of motor car fame, he said, think that you can, think that you can't, either way, you're right. Ten spies said, we can't, and they didn't. A man called Paul said, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. And that's exactly what he did. A whole army equipped with swords and spears and bows looked at a nine foot high warrior and they were dismayed. And every morning and every evening for six whole weeks as Goliath came down to face them, they ran away in fear. That was how they saw it with their eyes. They were terrified. A 16-year-old shepherd boy who'd never been in an army in his life looked at the same giant on the same day and he said, who is this uncircumcised Philistine that he should defy the armies of the living God? Armed with only a sling and a stone, he killed him. Now that's the difference in perception. They all looked at the same world, but a different outcome came about because they saw differently. Jesus said the eye is the lamp of the body. If your eyes are healthy, not your physical eyes, but meaning it, your spiritual perception, the way you look at things. If your eyes are healthy, your whole body will be full of light. But if your eyes are unhealthy, your whole body will be full of darkness. You know, as a Christian, your life can actually be full of darkness. Many believers are not living the life that Jesus wants them to live on the inside. They're filled with anxiety, with fear, with bitterness, what Jesus called darkness. He goes, it's because your spiritual perception is wrong you're looking at things wrong and so point two on the notes there was a difference of opinion between Jesus and the church in Laodicea and how many of you know when there's a difference of opinion between Jesus and you who's right it's always Jesus isn't it Jesus said to the Laodicean church you are blind the most surprising thing was that the church actually didn't know it and you think if someone was blind, they might be able to see it. But one feature of spiritual blindness is that normally people that are spiritually blind can't see that they're spiritually blind. They think that their outlook is right. Otherwise, they wouldn't think it. They don't think they're blind. They think this is how the world is. But Jesus goes, no, that, that, that's wrong. You compare your life to my life and then you'll be able to see how spiritually blind you are. In Laodicea, they thought they were prospering spiritually. They said, I'm rich. I'm rich in Christ. I've got all the promises. I've acquired wealth. I know more than I used to do when I was first saved. I used to be a little Christian. Now I've grown. I've read all these books and I've been to all these conferences. I don't need anyone to come and tell me anything because... I've got the Holy Spirit and I know everything. 
sounds like many modern Pentecostals. But Jesus looked at their life and he had a different opinion. He said, I know your deeds. It's not just your words, it's actually what is the fruit that is flowing out from your life. As you walk through this earth, what changes around you? Everywhere Jesus went, something changed. Jesus goes, I know your deeds. And I'm looking at your life and my honest opinion, I am the truth. And my honest opinion is that you are wretched, pitiful, poor, blind and naked. Now, that doesn't quite fit in some people's picture of who Jesus is. You know, we think Jesus is always there putting an arm around our shoulder and going, you're beautiful, you're fantastic, you're doing amazing. And there's truth in that. Jesus wasn't talking about their position when he, he said, you're wretched, pitiful. They, they were still saved. They'd still go to heaven. He was talking about their performance, how they were living, the outflow from their life. And Jesus loves us so much that he doesn't want to leave us how we are. Jesus died for so much more than you are living in. And he's offering it to you. He goes, here, I died for all of this. Your life could be like this. Why don't you just notice that there's something wrong and start asking me for more? The Laodiceans, they thought they were rich, so they weren't calling on the grace of God. And in that way, they were never growing. That's how we call down the blessings of heaven. That's how we get more of God in our life by recognizing that there's a problem, that there's a need. And I really believe that, you know, God will give us as much as we ask for. Someone said, God will only give you those things that you can't live without. And as we become more desperate and we get to that point where I can't live, God, unless you answer this prayer, unless you give me that thing, unless you change me, unless you give me more fruit, in my life unless you let me see more people saved when we get to that point of desperation god goes i was i've waited a long time for you to want that enough for me to be able to give it to you many people think they're doing fine just because they're a christian and they go to church point three on the notes people think I've given my life to Jesus. I pray a little bit, not very much. I read my Bible maybe once or twice a week for a few minutes. I know I'm no Billy Graham, but my spiritual life is, is good enough. I'll, I'll be fine. And Paul reminds us in 1 Corinthians 10 about the people of Israel under Moses. And he, he said, you know, they were... They were saved too. They were dramatically saved out of Egypt. They were baptized as they went through the Red Sea. What a miracle that was. They lived under the very Shekinah glory of God for 40 years. The cloud by day, the fire by night. They had miraculous provision of bread and meat. Even water flowed out of a solid rock. You'd think they were fine, wouldn't you? People like that, living under the glory of God. And yet, what did Paul say? He goes, none of them made it into the promised land. And so often we bank on the fact that we've given our life to Jesus. We're saved. We rest on our laurels. And Paul goes, no, they, they too did all that stuff. They were saved. They were called. They were baptized. They lived in the glory. And yet their bodies fell in the wilderness and not one of them inherited the promises. Are you going to be one that inherits the promise that God has got for your life? All those promises in the Word of God. Your life can ascend up to that level. Or are you going to be one who talks about it, thinks about it, but it never comes down into your life? It depends on how we live and it depends on how we see. Jesus offers, I salve to heal our eyes so that we can see correctly. Last week we talked a bit about the background of the city, the Roman city of Laodicea. One thing I didn't go into too much last week was that it was the ancient world's 
most famous center for healing eye diseases. And people would come from miles away, hundreds of miles away to Laodicea if they were having problems with their eye blindness because uh, of famous ointment that they made there uh, that was called a Phrygian powder made through a top secret formula. We talked about the geothermal pools that were there, you know, as the water bubbled up, the geothermic hot water, it brought all these salts up and they were rich in aluminium and uh, zinc and they used to grind up the rocks and mix them with olive oil and make this special ointment that would actually work to cure people's eyes. Even today, they use zinc and sulfur in many eye treatments. And it had a large and famous medical school in Laodicea uh, that specialized in treating eyes. And their most famous graduate was this guy, Demosthenes Philolathes, who was the author of the most influential work on ophthalm ophthalmology in the ancient world. His book was read right up until the Middle Ages as the textbook for how to treat eyes. So they knew everything in the natural, how to treat eyes. And yet in the spiritual, they, they hadn't realized that they need to come to Jesus, just like people came to them, to their hospital. Jesus goes, look, if you want to see things right, you need to come to me, and I will help you to see differently. Point five on the notes. The root of spiritual blindness. What, what's gone wrong with our eyes so that we can't see correctly? Well, as we probably know, spiritual blindness came into the world originally when Adam and Eve first fell. In the Garden of Eden, the first sin that was committed came about because Satan attacked Eve's eyes. I don't know if you've ever thought of it like that. Jesus said, your eyes are the gate through which either darkness or light comes into your life. And in the beginning, Adam and Eve's eyes, their spiritual perception was the same as God's. God created all this stuff, all the world, the garden, and he looked at everything, he said it was good. And Adam and Eve looked at it and it was good. The garden was good, the food was good, the animals were good. Each other, they were naked, but it was all beautiful and lovely. They had the same eyes as God. But then Satan came into the garden and he offered Eve an alternative perspective. He looked at the world through different eyes. And as he looked at the world, this is what he saw. He said, there's more that you could have. There's something you're missing out on. God is withholding something good from you. That was his perspective. That was how he saw the world. Because you remember Satan used to be the highest of the archangels, surrounded by beauty and light in God's presence. But in his eyes, that wasn't enough. He was the closest to God in heaven. But that wasn't enough through his eyes. He wanted more. And through that, he became pride, proud. And he fell at it. You can read the scriptures there in point 5D. And so... There in the garden, God put two trees. And I, I, I love this. This is so deep and so profound. It says, Genesis 2 verse 9.6a on the notes. In the middle of the garden was the tree of life and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Have you ever noticed that before? In the middle of the garden. Right next to to each other all paths led there you couldn't go anywhere without going down those paths and passing these two trees that were planted right next to each other one of them was the tree of life they were allowed to eat from that tree as often as they wanted and next to that tree was the tree of the knowledge of good and evil and God forbade them to eat from that tree God said if you eat from that tree, you will die. So one was the tree of life, 
The other was the tree of death. Side by side, one was the tree of God. Jesus said, I am the life, and we know all life comes from God. And in the other tree, curled up in the branches, was Satan, who loves to kill, steal, and destroy the tree of death. And that tree was called the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. A strange name, isn't it? Tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Now, Adam and Eve were already living in the knowledge of good. They had that already. They had the knowledge of good. The devil goes, there's more that you can have if you eat this tree. If they already had good, and they had the knowledge of good, what would they gain by eating that tree? The knowledge of good and evil. The only thing they could gain, they didn't see it. But that was the truth. The only thing they could gain was the knowledge or the experience of evil. And these trees were planted next to each other, and it's like this in life as well. If you want to eat from the tree of life, you have to turn away from eating from the tree of death, which is right next to it. You look at them both as a choice, and if you want the life that comes from God, all the time you have to turn away from that other tree. <clears throat> Point seven on the notes. As I said already, the devil tried to put his perspective of the world on Eve. And this is how the devil looks at the world. I should be God. God's trying to stop me from having what is rightfully mine. I don't need to do anything that God says. I don't believe what God says is true. And he said to the woman, you certainly will not die. God knows that when you eat from it, your eyes will be opened. And you will be like God, knowing good from evil. Now it's possible that the devil believed that that was true. It's also possible that he knew it wasn't true and was lying. Because with the devil, you never quite know. The devil is deceived. He thinks he's going to win one day. He actually believes that. So he's deceived himself. But some things he knows, but he doesn't want you to know. So then he lies. You know, he knows that if you follow Jesus, you have all power and authority over him. But he lies about that, even though he knows. So in some things he's deceived. In other things, he, he lies and, you know, we should never believe what the devil says. The things that he promises to give, he never delivers on them. He said, if you do this, if you eat the fruit, you'll be wiser, you'll be happier, you'll be healthier, you'll be more like God. Your eyes will be opened. But what happened? This is what the Bible says. The eyes of both of them were opened and they realized they were naked. So they sewed fig leaves together. They made coverings for themselves. Then they hid from God among the trees of the garden. So the Lord banished them from the garden. So in that day, they were banished from the garden. They lost their close relationship with God. They lost the likeness of God. They were like God before. They were cut off from each other. And they started looking at the world differently. Death and curse came into their life from that moment onwards. Just a, a throwaway point. You can't eat forbidden fruit and still live in God's garden unchanged. You know, sometimes we think as Christians, well, I know that's not really right, but if I do it, it'll be okay because God will forgive me. Genesis teaches us that when you eat the forbidden fruit, something changes and you can't eat the forbidden fruit and then live unchanged in the holy presence of God it says that their eyes were opened and what really happened like I said earlier is that their eyes were open to evil now they started looking at the world not through God's eyes but through the devil's eyes and this world, it was the same garden, the same trees, the same animals, the same people, the same God. Everything was exactly the same. But now they looked at it, whereas before they could only see good and beauty and safety. Now 
They saw it was dangerous. It was frightening. It was shameful. That's the difference between your having good eyes, healthy eyes, or unhealthy eyes, God's eyes, or the devil's eyes. And you know, as we go through life, the devil tempts us in lots of different ways, doesn't he? He offers us a different perspective. Do this and it will work out like this. That person, you know, they're not a very nice person, are they? Listen to what they said, see what they're thinking. He offers us this perspective. And we can accept his perspective. We can eat from that tree or we can reject that perspective and eat from the other tree. At first we have a choice. The first time it comes that we could go that way or the other way, but as we go more into the devil's way, for example, fear. You know, COVID came along, didn't there? And this new dangerous thing and we might all die and our children will die and everyone will die. And you know, all the time the news was going like this. It was actually the same world that we'd been living in for a long time. But an altered perspective was offered to us. And at first, you, you like this, you, you know, people look at it, they weigh it up, they read about it. And not judging anyone, I don't want to talk too much about COVID, but I'm sure we all know different people who accept a particular narrative, whether this side or that side. And, you know, fear started to grip people like it had never done before. And at first, you have a choice. But as you get more into one particular narrative, and you accept that perspective, you look at it more and more closely, you go further into it, what happens is that you end up not having a choice. You lose your choice because you can only see that, you can't see the other thing anymore. Jesus said, if your eye is unhealthy, your whole body is full of darkness. And it must grieve Jesus when he looks at the lives of many in the church, that instead of being filled with joy, peace, gentleness, love, all the, the, the fruits of the Spirit, instead they're filled with anxiety, fear, bitterness, critical spirit, all these things that they don't flow from having good eyes. If you see the world right, you don't have those things in your life. And so, just for a minute, we're going to think about what does the world look like when you look through the devil's eyes and see if you recognize any of these characteristics in your own life or in the lives of others. <coughs> Dissatisfaction, this is point A, B on the notes. That was how the devil persuaded Eve to sin. It was by making her dissatisfied. There's more than you are living in. Things could be different. Now there's a godly dissatisfaction. And Paul said, I press on to take hold of all that for which Christ Jesus took hold of me. And as Christians, we can have more of God. We can go deeper into him and that will never end because that's a journey. But there's um, a, a, a wrong dissatisfaction that instead of driving you deeper to God in prayer, makes you complain. And how many of you know that, you know, complaining is never right? That was why, you know, God said so many times about the people of Israel under Moses, because they complained, they were grumbling in the desert, and God struck them with different plagues because of complaining. Dissatisfaction, if you find that you're complaining a lot because of your health, because of relationships, people at work, different issues, money, whatever, you know, Jesus said, do everything without complaining or arguing. I could go deeper into every point and preach probably one sermon on each one. I'm just going to fly over them and you can think more in your own time. Pride. It's easy to think that we are better than others. We know more than others. That's what the church in Laodicea was like. They thought, we're rich. We've made it. We're better than the church down the road and Jesus says do not think of yourself more highly than you ought to consider others as better than yourself fear I've talked a little bit about that already 
Jesus says, do not be afraid. That's the most frequent command out of every command in the scripture, the one that God says the most. In fact, it's over 500 times. I did a little count up with the concordance. It's like well over 500 just through the simple ones that say, do not be afraid, fear not, be anxious for nothing. It's expressed in many different ways, but it's repeated over 500 times. Now, there's nothing that even comes close to that in the Bible. And that tells me that probably the sin that people fall into the most, the, the wrong perception that people have the most is to do with fear. That we can't believe that God is in control of our life in this circumstance. For example, with COVID, you know, before we all believed in healing and God was greater than all of this. And then a little virus comes along and suddenly we can't believe it anymore. Has God got smaller? Have viruses got bigger than they used to be? Well, I'm not going to go too much into that. I'm just talking... Uh, you know, from the biblical point of view, don't let fear control your life. I'm not saying you shouldn't be careful. And, uh, you know, uh, I think many of the things that we were told to do were, were wise things. But if that leads you into fear, then you're going against what Jesus said, or God said over 500 times in the scripture, do not be afraid because your life is in my hands. I'm bigger than that. Shame. That's another one. It's easy to think that we're not good enough. We're no good. We're dirty. Unbelief. This situation is too hard for God. And then ones to do with other people. Judging. Do you know the devil is always trying to tempt us to judge people, isn't it? Jesus said, don't judge anybody. You don't understand why they are doing the things they're doing why they're like, how they are. And we think that we can judge what is good and bad about a person. We can accept them on our side or they can be on the other side. That We don't really like those people. And then how many times do we side with the accuser of the brethren when it comes to other people in the church? You know, the devil is called the accuser and he's always trying to condemn and put people down and so often we side with them. You know, someone comes and oh, did you hear what so-and-so did about that? Uh, what they said and how bad that is. We go, oh, yeah, wasn't it bad? We're siding with the accuser of the brother. <coughs> Jesus doesn't talk like that about people. And then sinful desire. So, do you know, all those things, it, the devil looks at the world. He looks at people. He looks at the work environment. He looks at, you know, the... the the earth and he, he looks at them through all those things and, and more beside and the world for the devil is a dark place full of bitterness and striving fighting relationship issues lack problems pain that, that that's how he sees the world but god looks at the world very differently and jesus wants to heal our spiritual blindness so that we can again see the world as he sees the world so that we can walk through this world with peace without fear with faith with confidence he said to the church i counsel you to buy from me salve to put on your eyes now what did he mean when he says buy what do you use for money how can you buy something from Jesus? Well, he didn't mean earn it. You know, if you work hard, you'll earn it and then you'll get it. I, I think he meant make a costly investment. <coughs> if you want this, then invest your time into getting this. Study in the Bible, read the words, talk to others. Pray about it. Prayerfully examine your attitudes on that subject. Work on changing your mindset. We need to work with both rock and oil. You know, like they, in Laodicea, they ground up the local rock and they mixed it with oil. We need to work with the rock, which is the word of God, 
the foundation, the man that built his house on the rock is the one who heard my words and obeyed it. We need to grind up the rock and we need to pour on the oil of the Holy Spirit. You know, so through worship and prayer and study of the word, trying to transform ourselves like an ointment needs to be worked into your eye. You, you rub it in like that. We need to work on our attitudes. We need to take that promise that's written there and we need to keep repeating it to ourselves. We need to pray about it and work it into our life until it goes deep inside and then the, the darkness starts to lift and we walk through the world looking at things differently. Point 10, I'm not going to take on with this because again it's a whole sermon series. Jesus wants us to look at the world through his eyes. We need to love each other. Now we all know that, but that means that annoying person that's always winding you up, that bad person who bad mouths you and criticizes you. We need to love even our enemies because Jesus always wants the best of, for people and he's always seeking to draw them close to him. Do you feel like that's about the bad people in your life? Are you seeking to draw them close? Are you wishing the best for them? Jesus always looks at people with grace and forgiveness. He keeps no record of wrongs. That's hard to do, isn't it? Isn't that hard to do when someone has really been bad to you? When you meet them to wipe out the whole record of wrongs and look at them through Jesus' eyes of love, grace, and mercy. And then Jesus has these amazing prophetic eyes where he looks at people and he sees in them more than they see in themselves. He goes, I was there when I formed you in the inmost part. I had dreams about you. You can be much more than you are now if only you'd fully give your life to me and find all that I've got for you. Do you remember how Jesus called Peter? He was this rough, uncouth, impetuous fisherman. He was called Simon in those days, which literally meant to read. You know, he bent in the, the wind. It, whatever happened, that's the way he'd go. And Jesus prophetically saw his future. He saw his destiny. And God wants to give us that eyesight so that we can look at people and see not what was there, not even what is there now, but something more. We're designed in the image of God and God is great. And if you're not great as a person, then you're not living up to the full image of God. God wants you to be great in whatever sphere you're in. You're meant to be great. Looking through Jesus' eyes, faith. Jesus knew that the world was completely in God's hands and his life was in God's hands. No one could do anything to him before his time. And so when the whole village of Nazareth gathered and they dragged him physically to the top of the cliff to throw him off. He didn't worry. He wasn't afraid because he knew it wasn't his time. And in a way that we won't know till we get to heaven, it says in the Bible, he just walked through their midst and went on his way. And several times in the Gospels, you can read about how they tried to kill Jesus, but it wasn't the time. And if your life is in God's hands, then no virus, no arrow that flies through the darkness, it says in Psalm 91, no pestilence, no enemy can push you out of God's will because God is in control. God is greater than all of that. And then truth. Now this is a feature we don't really know about Jesus and we don't particularly like it until a little bit later on our journey when we realize that actually if we want to change we don't just need someone to say i love you you're doing well and everything's nice we need someone to say actually that thing there that you do isn't right that's holding you back that is wrong you need to change that 
Jesus is the truth. And you know, when we die and we stand before Jesus face to face, it's one of those I'm longing for it and dreading it because I know that Jesus will show me how I actually was and how I could have been but wasn't uh, because that's just how he is. How do you think we'll change into his likeness? By seeing how we're not in his likeness and repenting or whatever the process is in heaven. But as we get closer to Jesus, he shows more about ourselves and we see more about others and we need to speak out as well. You know, when we see things that are wrong, if we hear people gossiping or complaining or whatever, in a loving and sensitive way, we need to go for the truth. And then justice. Jesus looks at the world with justice. He's zealous against evil. He works to lift up the oppressed, actively works to help the poor, the needy, the outcast, and the lost. And so should we. So that's how the world looks through Jesus' eyes. It's very different, isn't it? And I think we all have something of an eye disease in us, the way we look at people, the world. You know, we all look somehow through the devil's eyes still. And God goes, come, come to me by my eye self. Work it into your life and then you will be able to see. Amen. Let's just pray to finish. Lord, so many things there in that uh, one phrase. Please help me to see the ways that I am wrong. The way that I hurt people without knowing it. The way that I close the door to your power and your presence. Teach me to open my heart, my mind more so that you can come in in your fullness. Help me to walk through this world with your perspective on people, on circumstances, on money, on disease, on the suffering, on the sick, on the nations. Lord, help me to see through your eyes. In Jesus' name. Amen.